All right. We are recording. So welcome this morning. I'm so excited to see you guys again during our seminar series. We've been on, um, we're not fully in quarantine anymore, I guess. I guess we get to socially distance and hang out. I don't know what that that stage is called, but we've been doing, starting a series and we've continued it weekly. And uh, I'm excited about today because we're going to talk about gut health, weight loss, and your mood and other things. And we have um, my dear friends and mentors, um, Tom and Barb Pingree, they're um, a doctor and a nurse, power couple, <laughs> and experts in gut health. And I thought we'd have them to talk, talk about it and share with us from their expertise. So I'm going to turn it over. And if you have a question, just type in the chat, Rose, I have a question, or type in your question, and then we'll cover it uh, either during it or at the end. Okay. You guys are on. Well, thank you for having us, Rosa. Um, just a couple of disclaimers. Um, you can see we're working with our new virtual background. It's not perfect yet, so it seems a little weird. Like I disappear all of a sudden. I, I apologize. We're still we're getting there. Um, the other thing is we, we're, we're at home and we live out in the country. We have animals. You may hear a rooster crow occasionally, and our dog is in here. And sometimes she falls asleep and snores. So we apologize ahead of time. Um, so. A little bit about myself. I'm a physician, like, like Rosa was saying. Um, I'm actually in the world of geriatrics and, and, and specifically nursing home care and palliative care. Um, I spent the, the bulk of my career there. And to be honest with you, the reason why this topic started getting to be interesting for me is that um, when you're in the nursing home and folks are there, they've lived in there for the rest of their lives, they have all these pictures of when they were younger and they looked just like us. They were, you know, playing with their family, family pictures, whatever. And I'm old enough now that I'm like, you know, I, I would prefer not to be like that. You know, um, you know, some of these folks just, they, 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 they may have had accidents or they may have illnesses they can't do anything about. But a lot of them, um, it's diabetes, heart disease, uh, vascular disease, things that frankly, you can do something about with the knowledge that we have these days. So even though this material I'm going to be going over today isn't what I do in my day-to-day -day practice, it's something that has become um, a great source of personal interest for me, both for my own health, the health of other people, health of my family. And so um, this is kind of what I'm learning and gleaning. I'm, I'm learning every day. This is a field that you could easily get a PhD in. Um, the stuff I'm going to cover today could be unpacked and could be several semesters of college courses. Uh, it's also a rapidly developing um, area of research of which there's a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of things that frankly may change over time. But I'm going to do the best I can to kind of present it in a way that is, is understandable and kind of gives us the information at, as we have it at this time. Um, just as an a, a aside, there, if, if you're interested in going deeper, particularly on the diet side, there is a book I recommend. I'll hold it up, but, but, but it's how, well, can't really, <laughs> can't really see it, sorry. Um, I will put something up about it later. But, but, but it's a, it's, there, there, there's a physician, Dr. Michael Greger, who um, his first book was How Not to Die. How not to die. And what he talked about in this is a diet that can help reverse vascular disease and, and heart disease. Um, it was of great personal interest to him because um, I think it was his grandmother who was diagnosed to have severe coronary disease, made some really radical dietary interventions and was able to really turn back her disease and live for several years after that. So that, that that's my great interest to him. Now he's kind of taken his interest into the weight loss area and has a book called How Not to Diet, um, which really focuses in on a lot of the research, not getting away from fad diets and things that'll help you lose 30 pounds in two months, but then a year later, you gained 30 pounds back and 10 more pounds on top of it. This is the way to have um, permanent dietary and lifestyle changes that can lead to permanent weight loss. So just as if you're interested in getting deeper and deeper into that part of it, by all means, that, that that's a great resource. So I am gonna share my screen. I did put together a PowerPoint um, for this. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Um, all right, go ahead. I thought maybe I should introduce myself since I'm here. Can you see me or? Yep, you look okay. great. <laughs> I'm a retired RN. Um, most of my time was spent up in the ICU as a strong. Um, but a lot of my time was on the surgical floors. And what, between what I went through personally in my health journey and what I saw in the hospitals made me want to really um, dive deeply into this as well because I would see patients on the floor that yes, there, there are things that you cannot avoid, um, things that are just going to happen genetically, but there were a lot of people on the floors that essentially put themselves there because of lifestyle and poor choices and not taking care of their health. So as I'm getting older, I don't want to end up there if I don't have to be. So I want to be here for my family. I want to be here for all the causes that are dear to me. And I know on the other end, what can happen if you don't take care of yourself. So that is my interest in this. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom because he's going to explain it all to you. That's so yeah, great. I think that, Tom, that- can I ask you one question? Sure. Can, can you tell us the doctor's name again of the book? Sure, it actually, tell you what. And type it in. I will, <laughs> actually, I pulled it up on here, Rosa, too. So I can do a new share. This okay. share, so. This will be in the recording. Um, where are you? Oh dear. Um, okay. Can you see me okay? okay? Somehow I put this whole thing up in the corner and now I need to make it big again. Oh yeah, um, so click on that. Yeah, click on the one in the corner. I need to yeah. share. So I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint presentation, sure. but it's there and it's there in the recording, so. Great. Any other questions, Rosa? No, I think we're good right now. No one, and everyone, if anyone who's joined late, just write your question in the chat and we'll uh, address it. Great. Barb, anything else you want to No, go ahead. Great. Right. So the title of my presentation today is Gut Health, How It Affects Your Weight Loss and Your Mood, and kind of with the current understanding that we have about the gut and how it affects your health. And on this, I have to do this. So um, this is the way we used to think of the gut. Even a decade ago. We honestly thought that the gut was just a bunch of plumbing. Um, you ate, the gut would take in the food and the water, would digest it, and would absorb it. And it was just basically a bunch of plumbing. We knew that bacteria lived in the gut, but at best, they were just there. Um, at worst, they caused a serious infection. And that list is very long, Salmonella, Shigella, some of the E. coli, cl Clostridium difficile, all those things you hear about um, in, in the news from time to time. We thought the primary, and in many ways, the only function of the gut was to help digest the food and absorb the food and water and nutrients, and then expel the rest. We knew that there were nerve endings in the gut but we thought they were just there to help provide the proper contraction of the muscles in the gut to push everything along. And that, that proper contraction is, of the gut is known as peristalsis. So when you hear kind of your grumbling in your stomach and things like that, that is the peristalsis that we're talking about. But it turns out, or especially over the last 10 years or so, there's been a tremendous growth in the amount of understanding of the gut and what it does. And, and this picture over here on the left of the screen is kind of a presentation of, of all the different kinds of bacteria that live in your gut. Um, and instead of just being innocent bystanders hanging out in your gut, we, we now know that they're metabolically very, very active. And they can be very active in a good or bad way. So we, we refer to all this bacteria and other microorganisms in your gut as the microbiome. There are literally trillions of bacteria in any one person's gut. We know that there's good bacteria and that there's bad bacteria. And what you ingest can have a tremendous impact on your microbiome. And frankly, this is all brand new stuff. 
this is not stuff that we understood or even knew about 15, 10 years ago. And this is a rapidly evolving field. This is, uh, I think, a really cool picture. But this shows all of the nerve endings and the size of your nervous system within your gut. So obviously up on top there, the very, very top is your esophagus. You can see your stomach and all the, um, everything in those linings and all the way down through your, your gut, you can see just the massive amount of neurons and nerve connections that you have in, in your gut. This is called the enteric nervous system. Um, it is a part of your nervous system that is independent from your central nervous system. Your central nervous system we typically think of as your brain and your spinal cord. Um, it is independent from it, but it is interactive with it. It is not capable of rational thinking, but it has the majority of the body's serotonin receptors, so it's felt to have a significant impact on mood. Um, there's so much talk about serotonin and its importance in mood within um, stuff you hear in the general um, media and, and literature, and there's absolutely no doubt that, that the serotonin plays a very, very important role. But I think we used to, we used to think that, that serotonin receptors were primarily in the central nervous system. So there's a whole very, very popular class of antidepressant medications called um, SSRIs, which are serotonin-specific receptor inhibitors. The idea is that it keeps the serotonin active for longer, therefore improving one's mood. We used to think this all worked in the brain. And only over the past few years have we begun to realize that, you know, this is probably act primarily happening in your gut. But it's kind of funny because praises phrases like having a pit in my stomach and, and butterfly in my stomach now make a lot more sense knowing this fact. You know, we feel a lot of our emotions with our stomach. Um, and, and, you know, we hear about people, you know, about comfort foods, about, um, you know, eating when people are anxious. Um, this could be a lot of the reason why people do that is because of the fact that so much of the enteric nervous system is involved with mood. So I need to move this a little bit so I can see my screen. Um, so there's over 40 trillion bacteria microorganisms in an average size person. And you know most of them are in the gut, like I mentioned earlier. And there's only about 30 trillion cells in that person. So you have more microorganisms, bacteria in your body, quite a bit more than you have cells in your body. So just to kind of give you some, and, and like before we used to think, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, there are some bad bacteria, you need to wash your hands, you need to brush your teeth, you need to, you know, have good hygiene. But I think we're now realizing that um, these, these microorganisms, bacteria, they can be our friends and they can be our enemy. They, 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 they can be our friends or they can be our, our, our enemy. So looking at some of the recent research about this and about the gut microbiome and the effects on weight, there, there's about 77 pairs of identical twins around the world that have been identified where one of the identical twins is obese and one is lean. So obviously their genes are identical, they're identical twins, so the genetic component is taken out. So we can look at all the other environmental variables that can be impacting on them. And in studying the microbiome of these folks, they found that the lean subjects had a much higher degree of gut diversity so a much greater number of different organisms that was present in their gut microbiome. And then what was interesting is they took the microbiome of the obese twin of the pair and transplanted it into a lean mouse and the mouse would gain weight. And, but if the microbiome of the lean twin was transplanted, it didn't. They also, did other studies looking at mice where they would 
take the microbiome of an obese mice and give it to a mouse that didn't have a microbiome and gave it to them and that mouse became obese. If they gave it to a lean mouse from a lean mouse, that mouse would stay lean. You know, it, it can, it's, I think, difficult to look at um, non-human studies and put a lot of weight on them because we have found, you know, that that can really mislead you. But I think in this particular situation, particularly since there's some overlap with the human stuff, I think there is, um, it's, it's an interesting start point. I'll put it that way. But I think, you know, there, there's no reason why medical research can't primarily focus on the microbiome of humans with this study, and that's what they're doing as we speak. The studies are coming out. Um, you know, as, as we're sitting here at this talk, there's people working on these things around the world. Um, the bacteria also produce vitamins, such as vitamin K, and substances called cytokines that interact with the immune system and the enteric nervous system. And what a cytokine is, um, is a chemical that isn't a living cell itself, but is a chemical that can signal to another living cell a um, either turning on inflammatory process, turning off an inflammatory process, turning on certain, certain activities, turning off certain activities. It is really a very important um, mechanism that our own cells use to, to, talk, to talk to each other. But it's a way that the bacteria in our gut can talk to the cells in our body, which is really a fascinating thing if you really think about it, is that, that, that the, the bacteria in our gut are literally talking to our own cells and either having it do things that are good or things that are bad. Um, this is a just released um, photograph of what bad bacteria really look like. <laughs> it's just kind of a cute picture I saw that kind of just um, gave a graphic representation of the kind of bacteria you don't want to have hanging around in your gut. Um, so what makes good bacteria good and what makes bad bacteria bad? And there's a few different things to talk about in that regard. First one is bacteria can affect the degree of digestion of food. Um, this is not a really well studied, it's a little more theoretical than it is actually well studied. But the thought is that if bacteria don't break, um, you know, there's things that your body can't break down all the way. Like if you have a nut and you chew it, there's going to be parts of that nut that your body can't break down on its own. And if you have bacteria that can further break it down, you can increase your caloric intake. Um, but if you don't, you may not. But th this is, again, this is an area that we don't have a lot of um, super helpful information as to which bacteria break things down more and how to work with them. Let's see. So the production of cytokines, uh, this is what I was talking about a couple of minutes ago, and this is a very important aspect of the microbiome. Some cytokines are what we call pro-inflammatory, and some are anti-inflammatory. Um, inflammation is something that we now have no doubt in the medical literature that chronic inflammation is bad for you. We know that the, 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 because increased stress hormone release over time, um, cortisol and the other stress hormones, we know for a fact that it causes increased risk of, for, for obesity, increased risk of chronic disease. Um, we understand that fact. Problem is we don't fully understand yet how to impact on the presence of inflammation for folks in their body. And I think the microbiome is going, my personal feelings that the microbiome research is going to be unlocking a lot of those keys for us. And one of the, I think down the long run, this is going to be one of the major things that we learned about the microbiome and how good care of your microbiome can really decrease your risk of chronic disease, which is what I was referring to in the very, very beginning when we were talking about avoiding chronic disease ourselves as individuals and, and, and those that we care about. And, and just for everyone in general, I mean, 
um, doctors are trained to treat disease. That's how we're trained, to, to identify and treat disease. We're not trained, at least I wasn't trained, um, to prevent disease nearly as much as we are to identify and treat disease. So this is something that if you walk in to the, your average doctor and say, hey doctor, how can I go from being feeling good and healthy when I'm X age and make myself even better and better, that, that doctor may well not know everything that, that needs to be known. So you do kind of have to start um, searching on some of the stuff yourself and, and, and keeping yourself educated is very, very important. Another thing that bacteria does is they break down the indigestible fiber that is in our, that our body's GI tract cannot break down. So there's a lot of this in uh, legumes. Um, there's a lot of, you know, some beans and legumes and lentils, things like that. Raspberries have a high fiber content. Um, some of the fruits, oatmeal, um, bran cereals, Unfortunately, um, we don't, well, actually, let me finish and talk about that. Then I'll get back to fiber supplements. Um, but the bacteria breaks down this indigestible fiber and it becomes what we call short chain fatty acids. Now, usually we hear the word fat or fatty and acid and we think bad. I mean, those, you know, fat sounds bad and acid sounds bad. I mean, or acid in your car, the paint comes off, and fat as well, fat. Um, but actually, short-chain fatty acids are good for you. Um, and there's a growing body of medical literature that shows that short-chain fatty acids may inhibit hunger and help weight loss. Um, one of the studies I didn't explicitly put in this presentation, but I learned about from the How Not to Diet book, is that they actually took... Um, took human subjects, they put a tube into their large intestine, and they put in short chain fatty acids. And they actually found that they had an increase in their baseline metabolic rate. So therefore burned up more calories at baseline. And they had um, inhibition of their hunger. So really kind of direct evidence that, that short-chain fatty acids can help you. They also find that if you have a meal in the morning that's high in fiber, that you actually have a decrease in your appetite for up to 18 hours later. 18 hours. And so that... There's no way that that, high, that fiber is hanging out in your stomach for 18 hours. So obviously something is happening somewhere else in your gut that is causing this decrease in your appetite. So how do you improve the health of your gut microbiome? Um, I, I think that there's a lot of compelling evidence that whole food is really good for you and plant-based is really good for you. Doesn't mean that you have to become a 100% vegan to get these benefits. I think there is a lot of literature to show that simply by cutting back and having it less often, it um, already gives you a lot of benefit. We talked about fiber for the reason I talked about. Here is a picture showing a lot of high fiber foods. So there's a lot of fiber. Um, in, in brand cereal, you know, brand cereals, if, if, if you're going to get, you know, a big amount of fiber, I think, you know, that like, like uh, brand cereals are a great way to go, but you see oatmeal here, you see tomatoes, bananas, apples, pears, um, whole grain bread, you see raspberries there, you know, great time of year here in this part of the country to go out and pick your own raspberries or buy it from a farm market. What a great time of year right now to really increase your, your fiber intake in a way that's very, very healthy and delicious. Avoiding unnecessary antibiotics. Now, as a doctor, um, you'd think I'd be pro-antibiotic. And it's interesting, we've known now for 
a long time that antibiotics really drive a lot of multi-drug resistant organisms. So you give penicillin to someone and all of a sudden there, it kills the bacteria and then they're sensitive to penicillin, but it doesn't kill the ones that aren't sensitive to penicillin. All of a sudden you have a bunch of bacteria that don't respond to normal antibiotics. But there's another reason that we're discovering that antibiotics can harm you. It can really have a dramatic impact on your microbiome. Of course, you put antibiotics into your body, it's gonna kill your, a lot of your microbiome. And it takes, unfortunately, it takes months. Now, I'm not advocating not taking antibiotics. When you have a bad infection, and probably all of us, I know I've had a bad infection. I had a peritonsillar abscess. Barb has had infections that, you know, have, she, she, she needed antibiotics for. But I'm not gonna go in and look at antibiotics for a common cold. Or, or something like that. I'm really going to be very careful and work with my physician. I'm a doctor, but I'm my own doctor. Barbara's her own doctor. And we're going to work very carefully to make sure that whatever, if we need antibiotics, we really need them. If you need them, you need them. But if you don't need them, really try to avoid them. Probiotics. You can take supplements that have what we know to be good bacteria, and you can take them as supplements, and this can help improve the health of your gut microbiome. The names of these um, groups of species of bacteria are ones that we know are, are some of the healthier ones. Now, lactobacillus, you've been hearing about lactobacillus and yogurt forever. We, we've known this is something that, that is very helpful in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, you, see, um, you see other ones, Bifidobacterium, Streptococcus, Thermophilus. These are families of bacteria that are not part of, you know, you don't pick up the Democrat Chronicle and see an article about Thermococcus, Streptococcus, Thermophilus very often, if ever. And so these are the ones that are good for you. And then, you know, getting back so we're talking about the cytokines. Um, they, these are the ones that produce the good cytokines that help you know, decrease inflammation. Um, we believe help decrease hunger. And um, can al also we believe, this gets back to the enteric nervous system, we believe help decrease cravings. Um, you know, you have people who are addicts to sugary material, uh, to, to, to sugary substances, whether it be soda or candy, um, you know, they just can't give up their their their, their Pepsi or their Coke or, or whatever. There's a really good chance that the interaction between your microbiome and your enteric nervous system is playing a big role in those cravings. Prebiotics talked about probiotics, which are the actual bacteria. Prebiotics are compounds in food that induce the growth or activity of the beneficial microorganisms. And what we're finding now, it, so for the microorganisms that you're either taking as a supplement or that are already in your gut, you can feed them the raw materials they need to grow and flourish, which will help them be active and help them increase your gut diversity. We talked about that in the identical twin studies earlier, that the lean identical twins had a much more diverse microbiome. And they've also done some studies looking at the bacteria that are more prevalent in folks who have a primarily plant-based diet versus folks who eat a lot more meat and fish. And we find that the that those families of bacteria appear to decrease um, cravings for food and to increase satiety. Again, early in the, in the, in the subject's net, but we, there, there, there seems to be something there. Um, you can get high fiber foods or examples of dietary sources of prebiotics, but you can also get them in the form of supplements. Um, it's interesting because only about 5% of Americans meet the minimum daily recommendation for high fiber, which is up in the 25 to 30 gram 
um, if you're not eating those things we talked about earlier, it is really, really difficult to get enough fiber into your system to be able to get to that fiber um, recommendation without having an excessive amount of calories in your diet. Unfortunately, um, studies that have looked at the production of short chain fatty acids by your gut bacteria, if you take fiber supplements, they don't digest the fiber supplements in the same way that they do other sources of, of, of fiber from foods. So a fiber supplement, like a powder, might be good for bulking stool, but isn't digested by the good bacteria, therefore producing the short chain fatty acids that we talked about. So thank you. Um, I picked this, I thought this little green <laughs> smiley thing was kind of sort of like a good, ba <laughs> good, good, good bacteria <laughs> microorganism. Um, and I am open to questions, but Rosa, I'm going to toss it back to you to moderate the rest of the way along. Sure, sure. Thank you. That was really, really interesting. So I do have a couple of questions in the chat that I'll throw out at you while we're still recording, but I do want people to be able to interact if they, if they want to, too. So one question, well, one, Wendy asked a couple. One was, um, is there a practical way to measure your your uh, microbiome is there as far as what diversity is in your gut biome yeah um not readily available um that, that, I, actually i was just thinking about that question this morning myself um there there isn't um commercial readily available commercially available tests that can do that it's at this point just being done in research settings um i'm hoping that over the coming years and i believe it will that they'll be able to come up with a meaningful um, way of, of looking at it because the problem we have right now is you know you can throw a sample into a petri dish and get stuff to grow out but it, it's it's difficult to you know quantify and qualify it and we certainly don't have any way of measuring how meta how metabolically active those bacteria are so unfortunately no but I anticipate over time I just saw a um, article a few days ago, and, and I was talking to a gastroenterologist now several months ago, that when you talk about illnesses like irritable bowel syndrome, um, they are really starting to believe that the microbiome is going to be the thing that is the most helpful for folks with this. And they're finally getting around to making a standard part of the intake history what your diet is, which is amazing to think about. That, you know, they just kind of assumed a standard American diet for everyone, maybe individual people. They talked about, they, 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 they talk about, but just this now being the standard intake information that a gastroenterologist will um, ask about for someone with some kind of functional um, bowel issue. That's great. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Wendy's other question was, and I've got some rolling in, so this is good. Um, can you discuss pesticides, microplastics, and cookware elements, Teflon, silicone, how they impact the gut? Yeah, um, I'll be honest with you. This is not an area that I know a lot about. Um, is, so I, I've been focusing more about you know, the food and the um, use of supplements than I have for other things. Um, so unfortunately, I have to um, admit that I don't know. That's okay. That's cool. And then, um, and Barb, feel free to chime in as well. Uh, Kathy has a question. Wait a minute. I think I, before Kathy, I want to say someone else had a question maybe, or maybe it was Kathy's. Um, optimal ingredients for probiotic supplements. Um, also, please discuss prebiotic supplementation. Okay. Um, well, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I think there's a, you know, no one has, here is the ideal, absolute, best combination of probiotics that we should have in a supplement. Going back to that slide that I showed, we know the families of bacteria that we believe are good bacteria. Um, one of the pieces about it, and this is a huge problem 
in the non-FDA regulated supplement industry is the problem with, are you actually getting what the label says you're getting? Um, I don't know how much folks are aware, but now three or four years ago, the New York State Attorney General went into Walgreens, um, GNCs, and one other major chain just bought stuff off the shelf, brought it to a laboratory, did an analysis, and what was in the bottle wasn't there, and what wasn't in the bottle, what, what they didn't say was in the bottle was there. So there's a huge problem with quality control, and because it's not FDA regulated, the FDA doesn't have any significant purview over that. You know, there's talk about, you know, will the FDA get involved, but I guarantee if the FDA gets involved, it's going to decrease the amount of um, availability of things because maybe a lot higher standard to making it. So what you have to do is you have to go, and what I recommend doing is finding, first starting with a company that has a great process so that when they say, here is what is in this bottle or this powder, that it really is what you're getting. The other piece is, you know, with the prebiotics, we're still learning what is best for that, but the same thing goes back. You, you kind of go to the companies that are internally doing their best research at the best quality control, and then um, take a product, take it for 60 days and see how it goes. Um, it, you know, to me, the problem with supplements is it's going to be beyond our lifetime before we know the answers to all these questions. So obviously if we wait until all the answers come in, it's not going to help us in our lifetime. Because we won't be. Um, or we want to be helped in the next year or two or three. So, for, when, when I think about this for myself, I think about, okay, um, I, I don't know how many remember, but there was a, um, people like, it was like 20 years ago, were taking L-tyrosine as a supplement, and they were getting this nerve damage. It turns out, it wasn't the, so, so they pulled all the L-tyrosine off the market, and no one could sell it. And when they did an analysis of these L-tyrosine they found out that, 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 that there was a pesticide in there. Mm. Again, it was a contaminant in the L-tyrosine bottle, not the L-tyrosine that was causing the problem. So the first order of business is to be confident that what you're taking is safe and contains what it says it contains and doesn't contain pesticides or other things that have been concentrated in the process. So doing research about the folks you buy stuff from and not just randomly going in and buying the cheapest bottle of probiotic in GNC, Walgreens, or wherever. You know, these companies, you know, Wegmans, any of these people, they're not the ones vetting what's on their shelves 100%. They're not, I mean, obviously they're going to knowingly have something up there, but a lot of people just don't know. So that, that's the first order of business. Second order of business is to, if you're confident what you're taking, is you take it for 60 or 90 days. And you see how you feel, see how it goes for you. Um, I've been taking prebiotics, probiotics now for several years, and I feel a lot better. We, we've gone to a, um, about a year ago, our family, including our son, who's 12, almost 13. So when he just turned 12 years old, we went to the lifestyle medicine um, practice here in, in, in Rochester, and we took a two-week jumpstart um, whole food, whole food, plant-based, very low um, oil diet. And I feel better on that diet. I, I, I lost some weight. It's, it's not, you know, you can always end up gaining weight in the diet. But um, I think I, I, know, I know I feel better. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm confident that that's better for my health. Um, so that's something that, you know, I tried. I feel better. It's safe. I've also been taking prebiotics and probiotics now for longer than that. And I feel better on them. Um, just say sure. Can I just say something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have a, a 12, almost 13 year old. I'm probably saying, oh, she looks kind of bad for <laughs> I mean, kid. We have four grandchildren as well. 
<laughs> we adopted late. So I, I just want to put this disclaimer in there that, no, I'm not 30. <laughs> so, but anyway, I feel like I am. <laughs> so I think, you know, that that's kind of, Rosanna, I, that, that's yeah. kind of a very long, um, winded um, explanation. But I think there is no one size fits all. This is, I would start with the company and go then go to what they have available. Trial it for yourself for a decent amount of time, 60, 90 days, see how it goes. If you don't see a benefit in 60, 90 days, it's not, it, that, at least at that point, your life is probably not going to work. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I totally agree. I know I have my favorites because I've certainly done what you've said and, and found they're not. They're not equal. Um, why don't we, we'll, we'll stop the recording and then we can open up and finish some questions. Is that okay with you guys? Sure. Okay. So I will, so that we can chat a little bit and let me, so thank you so much, um, Tom and Barb for, for joining us and um, feel, we're just really excited that you came and this was really great, really informational. I took a couple screenshots and I took some notes. So awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Important stuff. I mean, it's, to me, it's the, the basis of everyone's health. I mean, this is where you start. It, it's, it's it's so important, and and I think the more people that understand it, start and start realizing, yeah, the healthier this we're all going to be. So, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.